One evening, uh, Sherlock and his apprentice Watson were going out on a camping trip. And so they got all their gear together and they hiked some miles into the wilderness. And after a few beverages, they crawled into their tent and went to sleep. And at some point in the middle of the night, Sherlock woke up and he lays there and he looks up and digs his elbow into the ribs of Watson beside him. He goes, Watson, Watson, wake up, man. And Watson stirs a little bit, rubs the sleep from his eyes and says, well, what is it? What's going on? Sherlock says, look up. What do you see? Watson lays there and he says, stars and stars and stars. Sherlock says, and what does this tell you? Watson says, well, well, what do you mean, what does this tell me? Astronomically, it tells me that we're just one tiny planet in this vast universe. Astrologically, it tells me that the planet Venus is in the um, constellation Gemini. Meteorologically, it tells me that tomorrow will probably be a very nice day. Chronologically, it tells me it's roughly three in the morning. Theologically, it tells me that life is meaningless and we're just a speck throughout all of time. Why, Sherlock, what does it tell you? Sherlock says, Watson, you idiot, someone has stolen our tent. <laughs> it's hard to see the things that we're not looking for, even if they're right in front of our faces. We all do this. I happen to do this quite a bit when my wife tells me to find something from the fridge, and I can rummage around for a good five minutes trying to find something in there. And then I'll, I'll say, I can't find it. I, I think we must have used it last night. And she comes over and, of course, within 10 seconds goes, it's right here. Here and place. It's very common. People struggle with this, struggle with something that's right in front of their faces and yet we can't see it. The disciples struggled with this as well. They had been with Jesus for three years, walking, talking, learning. They had heard multiple predictions from Jesus about what was going to happen, that he was going to be put to death, but that he would rise again from the dead. And yet, on that Friday night or Thursday evening, when the Jewish authorities came and took Jesus, they were all shocked and afraid. That Friday when he was crucified, they were dismayed. They were lost. They scattered in fear. And even that Easter morning, they just weren't prepared for what was going to happen. Now Thomas is the subject of our gospel lesson this evening, and we fondly refer to him as Doubting Thomas. But poor Thomas gets a pretty bad reputation. You see, he's focused on the one as having all the doubts, but, you know, we never call Peter, Peter the denier. And yet, for some reason, this is what we highlight about Thomas. When all of the other disciples shared in Thomas's doubts, the women going to the tomb that Sunday morning weren't going and looking for an empty tomb and for a risen Lord. No, they were bringing burial spices to treat a decomposing body. The disciples weren't waiting around to encounter the risen Lord. They had locked themselves in a room because they were afraid and they didn't know what was going to happen next. And when the women came to their door and they knock on the door and say, we've seen the risen Lord, he's alive. Luke tells us that the disciples thought that they were talking crazy, that they, they weren't making any sense. All of the disciples doubted what they heard and yet for some reason it's Thomas that gets the bad reputation. Well, whatever the reason for that, doubt is a common human experience. The women had doubts. The disciples had doubts. We have doubts. We doubt the words of a friend when they make a promise to us, especially if they've broken promises in the past. Uh, we doubt our own ability to maybe complete a task, to achieve a goal. We doubt the news stories we hear, and even if we don't doubt those, we doubt the sources that we hear the stories coming from. We doubt whether our political leaders actually have our best intentions at heart. We doubt our financial position, whether we'll have enough money for the coming year. We experience so much doubt in our personal lives. But our culture is a culture that encourages doubt as well. Students in the universities are encouraged to doubt what they're taught, to question everything they're taught, to seek maybe if something's not being taught correctly, if there's another truth, if there's something else they need to learn. They're taught to test everything presented. Our culture encourages us to doubt organizations, especially organizations that are out to make money and see if they really have any good purpose about them. And people increasingly are encouraged to doubt 
uh, not only Christianity, but all religion, especially religions that make truth claims like Christianity. Any religion that says they have the truth, that this is what you have to do to be saved, is doubted. And instead, for the culture today, truth is relative. Truth is whatever you want it to mean. And as long as your truth doesn't interfere with my truth, it's all good. Truth is relative. And so in this culture of personal doubt, this culture of societal doubt, how do we as individuals and as a church respond to this doubt that we find? Often the church reacts like the disciples did. And the very human thing to do is to retreat from the world, to lock yourselves away, and to just exist in your own little society. At the time of Jesus, the group that did this was called the Essenes. And they lived in a desert out from the city. And they thought they had the truth. And so their truth was they were going to live there and do their worshiping, do their religion, not worry about the rest of the world. This is the practice of monasticism, especially in the Middle Ages, when they would have their monasteries secluded from everywhere else. And they would do their religious worship and not interact with the world around them. Many people today think that's similar to how we should act. Maybe not that we go out into the desert and seclude ourselves from the world, but we come to church on the weekends, maybe on Wednesday nights, and we do the church thing, and we have our community here. And then as we go out into the world, we play by society's rules. We do what society says. We don't make waves. We don't rock the boat. On an individual level, the matter becomes more complicated. Beyond just the doubts about how to engage culture, many people struggle with personal doubts of their religion as well. And so don't raise your hand. I don't want to see your raised hands. Just think to yourselves, have you ever doubted a claim of Christianity? Have you ever doubted Jesus is who he said he is? Have you ever doubted Jesus actually came, that Jesus was raised from the dead? Have you ever doubted your forgiveness? Said, I'm too bad. God just can't forgive me. Have you ever doubted your salvation? At times when these doubts arise, we often don't like to voice the doubts. We're afraid people will see that as a lack of faith. Uh, we'll be embarrassed. People will think, well, we're not really Christian. We just have to have faith. All those doubts go away when we have the right amount of faith. But I'm telling you, the opposite of faith is not doubt. The opposite of faith is not doubt. It's certainty. Doubts, when they're used correctly, can actually be a tool to strengthen our faith, to strengthen what we believe, to lead us into the truth of what Christ teaches, of who he is, of what we believe. So what does this look like? Recently, there's been a, a movie released, maybe some of you have seen it, called The Case for Christ. If you don't know about this, if you haven't heard about it, it follows the story of a, the author named Lee Strobel. The movie is based off of his book. His wife was, uh, uh, they were both atheists at some point, and then his wife came home and told him that she had converted to Christianity. Now, Lee Strobel was an investigative reporter for the Chicago Tribune, and so this conversion to Christianity had caused some conflict in Lee Strobel's marriage. And so he set out to use his investigative skills to disprove Christianity, to show that it wasn't real, and so hopefully to save his marriage through what he investigated. Uh, the movie traces what the book traces. Long story short, through his investigation, through his doubts, and following up on those doubts, looking into them, he turns out to convert to Christianity. Both Lee Strobel and his wife are still Christian. They've sold this case for Christ, which has brought potentially hundreds of thousands of more people into the faith as well. Doubts will beat you down if you let them. Doubts can scare you and petrify you, make you crawl in on yourself and say, I, just, I don't, I don't want to do this. I don't want to talk to anyone. I'm just going to sit here with my doubts. Doubts will tell you that God can never love someone like you. Doubts will tell you that God does not really exist, that Jesus didn't actually come, or if he did, he didn't actually raise from the dead. Doubts will tell you all of these things. And you can live with those doubts, live in those doubts, or you can use those doubts. Take those doubts. Dig into the scriptures. Find out what they actually say. Ask the hard questions of your friend group, your family, of the pastors here. Ask those questions. See what 
evidence there is for the reason that we have this faith. But ultimately, all of our doubts lead us back to the Scriptures. And the whole point of Scripture is to address these. You see, all Scripture that we heard this evening is written that we might believe, even if we have those doubts, we might believe even with those doubts, that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that He came for our sins, that He was raised from the dead. When we dig into the Scriptures, we find words like, Seek, and you will find. Knock. The door will be answered. You see, we don't have a God who stands far off, looks at us in our doubt, and says, figure it out. We have a God who comes into this world in the person of Jesus Christ. We have a God who meets us in our doubts, comes to us in his flesh as he came to Thomas. He comes to us in the sacraments, in baptism, in communion. He meets us in our doubts. He tells us who he is and why he came. He gives us the forgiveness of sins. Jesus gives us his eternal truth. And so that brings us back then to how the church should respond to this culture of doubt. The the church is not called to go into the desert and live separately. Some people want to do that, and they justify this by saying, well, we're we're in this world, but not of it, which is actually a gross misapplication of a chapter from John there. We're called to go into the world. Jesus in the Great Commission says, go into the world. As you go, make disciples of all nations. Don't stand aside. Go into the world. Proclaim his truth. So we don't come into this this Christian community and have only Christian friends. We form relationships with other people. People of other religions, the Hindu, the Muslim, anyone. We make those relationships and we live in such a way that Christ shows through us that maybe they start having doubts about their own faith. That they start asking the hard questions of you about why you believe what you believe, and you can lead them through the power of the Holy Spirit into faith in Christ. So why is this, why is this all important? Why is doubt important? Why is how we handle doubt important? Why can't we just live in the comfort of the church? Why can't we just be the church people, do our church thing, and then go play by society's rules? During the time that I was applying to seminary, one of the requirements for my district at least, I'm not sure if it's the same in all districts, One of the requirements was that I had to have a meeting with the district president. I had to have an interview with him. And I was quite nervous about this. I expected to walk into this man's office and to see a a large man with the full weight of the Rocky Mountain District of the LCMS behind him, sitting behind his great big desk, ready to grill me about questions of doctrine, questions of practice. I was just, I was so nervous for this meeting. And when I get there, I walk into this man's office, and he is sitting behind a desk, but he's not this great towering man that I thought he would be. He's about my height, a little bit smaller. He's got gray hair up on the roof. He's a very grandfatherly person. And instead of asking me to sit across him from the desk, he stands up, he warmly shakes my hand, and then leads me to a small sitting area that he had in his office. And for the better part of two hours, we conversed over this small coffee table. It wasn't a grilling of doctrine and practice, but just a conversation about life. Anything from family to relationships to school, any of that. As the conversation was winding down, I remember he stood up, and it was fairly obvious that the, our time was over. And I was getting ready to leave. I shook his hand. I said goodbye. And I'll never forget what happened next. He, he puts his arm around me, and he says, uh, come over to this window really quickly. He had a window that faced out onto the street, a rather busy street in uh, Denver there. And he says, look out the window. What do you see? And I gave some fumbling response that I can't remember right now. It probably made no sense to him either. But then he said, can I tell you what I see? Can I share that with you right now? And of course I said no, and I stormed out of the room. <laughs> so he said, can I tell you what I see? And I said, of course, yes, please do. And as the people walked by, he said, I see dead people walking around the streets. I see walking corpses of people that are dead in their sins, people that don't know Jesus Christ, people that don't know their Savior, people that don't have that new life. That's why I do what I do, to bring the truth to the people that need it. Jesus Christ didn't come to make bad people good. Jesus Christ came to make dead people live. He's given us his eternal truth. 
He's given us new life through baptism. He gives us the forgiveness of sins in communion and baptism. He loves us so much. He comes to the cross. He dies for us. And he rises again that we might have new life in him. That love that he shows us is the love that we're called to share with the world around us. And through the power of the Holy Spirit, he enables us to boldly profess the same as Thomas boldly professes, my Lord and my God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this evening. We pray that you would be with us in our doubts. We thank you that you're a God who meets us in our doubts. We pray that you would use them to bring us closer to you, bring us to your truth further, and help us to share that truth with the people, the world around us. We pray all of this in your son's name. Amen.